Okay. So, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar on ways that you can prepare uh, for program and translation and interpretation. M my name is Julie Johnson and I teach here at the Monterey Institute of International Studies. Personally, I teach courses from French to English, translation and interpretation, and I also work with students in their very last semester to prepare them to launch their careers as soon as they graduate. So, thank you so much for joining the webinar today. Um, you may be joining now or you may be joining later. Right at the moment, uh, there may be more than a hundred of us or so around the world connected uh, to this webinar. Now, we're connected by technology and we're also connected by a common aspiration. That aspiration being to consider, because you're considering uh, entering a program for translation and interpretation, and perhaps also because you would like to become one of the respected colleagues of those of us who do translation or interpreting or both for a living. So welcome to all of you. I'd say also to thank yourself for taking this time out of your day to move that aspiration from the realm of just being perhaps a dream to really being a reality. And this may be one of the first concrete steps that you're really taking, or you may have already applied to a program and now you're wanting to gear up for that. This webinar will address both of those positions. So first of all, let me outline for you what I plan to do over the next 15-20 minutes and then we'll be able to do some question and answer. So first of all, I am going to invite you to consider what exactly it is that we do when we're translating or interpreting because that will help the recommendations that I'm going to give you make a lot more sense. You'll know the reason why. Next, I would like to talk about some general ways that you can prepare uh, for a program in translation and interpretation. Um, so kind of paving the way. Um, and these are things that you can start very early on upstream. Let's say you may even still be in high school and that is a great time to start preparing for a career in translation and interpretation or you may still be at university. So these are general recommendations that will really apply to you so you can make the most out of what you're doing, how you're living, things that you're studying right now and understanding how that can really play into uh, being well prepared for translation and interpreting. Next I'll then talk about some of the really specific things that you can do. Like let's say that you have already applied or you're about to apply for a program and you'd like to know what you can do now to really begin to think like a translator or interpreter, how to listen like an interpreter, how to read like a translator. I'll give you some exercises in that regard. So, first of all, what is translation and interpreting? What is it that we're doing? I'd like to begin with, first of all, some definitions. So when we make a distinction in the profession, which you're probably already aware of, but just in case, translation refers to written work. So when we take a written document and we essentially reproduce that document or its essential content in another language. In contrast, interpreting is when we listen to a spoken message and we re-communicate that same message orally in another language. So translation written, interpreting oral. Now there is one skill that kind of bridges both oral and written and that's called sight translation. Not S-I-T-E but S-I-G-H-T. You know, on site. So what this means is somebody hands you a written document in one language and you read it out loud in another language. And this is something that is often needed because in human communications it's really common that we need to refer to written documents that may not have been translated in advance. And so it needs to be done 
on the spot. And so that is done with site translation. So translation and interpretation are both acts of communication. Unlike regular communication, when you have something that you want to say and you just say it or you just write it, translation and interpreting, of course, are about communicating someone else's thoughts, whether orally or in writing. And so that has a couple of imp implications. The first is that you, the translator or interpreter, actually understand what that person is saying and what they mean to say, the message that they're trying to get across. And secondly, that you are sufficiently fluent and adept in the target language, the other language that you're working into, in order to be able to express those same ideas in the same way as the original speaker or author did. And all of the tips and exercises and preparation that I'm going to talk about are ways to reinforce your ability to understand and then to re-express someone else's thoughts. And so this, ref with understanding, let me give you an example. There are a couple of things that go into understanding. Of course, the language. You need to be able to decipher what somebody is saying and make sense of the actual words, right? But even more importantly, you need to have the background knowledge, the background experience to know what it is they are talking about. Because you might understand the words, but if you don't understand the topic at all, well, they might as well be speaking ancient Greek or something. You know, it's just not going to make sense. For example, right now, uh, my advanced translation students just completed a translation on genetic engineering. And I was really struck by how often, in our discussing that translation, they kept talking about their high school biology classes. They were able to understand that text on genetic engineering in French and translate it into English effectively, not only because they had the words at their disposal, but because they understood the structure of G DNA. They understood transcription. They understood that how our DNA is made up of these small sequences called genes and that those genes are made up of the bases A, C, T, and G. I don't know if you've had biology, but that might be ringing some bells. And it's really that background knowledge that gave them the mental models they needed to make sense of what it was they were reading. If they had never, never studied biology at all, that text would have been really, really hard to understand and it would have taken them a lot longer to go back, do all the background information, find out about the structure of the cell, find out about basic genetics to even begin to make sense of the text. So there's a lot background knowledge and general experience play a huge role in an interpreter or translator being able to do his or her job effectively. In terms of expression, there are two sides, right? There's your native language for when you are translating or interpreting from one of your foreign languages into your native language. You may be thinking, well, I can speak, in my case, English just fine. I could write English just fine. But when it comes to expressing someone else's ideas, it's a little trickier. And you need to really hone your ability to speak in an articulate way, to speak clearly and have a vast array of vocabulary at your disposal so that you're not just speaking in the way that you normally speak but that you can adopt the way that that person is speaking. What if you're interpreting for a doctor? What if you're interpreting for a scientist? What if you're interpreting for a drug dealer? Being able to enter into that person's thought world and their way of expressing themselves. And so working at all of these sub-languages within even our own native language is really, really helpful. Then there's your, your foreign language. Obviously, if you are working from your native language into your foreign language, well, you need to be able to have as much of that language accessible to you as possible. 
have the words you need, the turns of phrase, be completely fluent, and be understandable. Sometimes accent or intonation get in the way. And so you might know what you're trying to say in the foreign language, but if nobody else can understand you, the interpreter, that's a real problem. And so it's not a trivial matter to really work on your accent and your intonation. And I'll be telling you some exercises that can help you to do that. Okay, so now that we have talked about um, what translation and interpretation is and what it involves, let's go through some general things that you can do even very early on, even if you're still a teenager, you can do this. So the first thing is to make it a habit to read extensively, all sorts of different things, um, and not just like little blogs and tweets and that kind of thing, but I mean deep reflective reading, where you're putting everything else aside and you're focusing in on really paying attention to what it is that you're reading. What's particularly helpful for translators and interpreters is to, on a daily basis, read the news. And I'm not talking about like Yahoo News or something like that, but a really well-written newspaper. In English, that might be the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Economist, these kinds of high caliber uh, news periodicals. And I'm sure you're aware of the analogous ones in your other languages. Like for French, I'd recommend primarily Le Monde. Um, in Spanish, it might be, I don't know, El País or something. And I wouldn't know for Japanese or Chinese, but you would certainly know yourself. So reading those on a daily basis and especially in your non-native language. What's particularly helpful is, let's say, what's a big thing right now? Just today, uh, we know that the uh, climate summit is going on at the UN. So read an article about that in English. And then let's say that your language is Russian. Finding a parallel article, a similar article about that in Russian. And by reading one, and then reading the other side by side or one just after the other, then you can appreciate how the same topic, the same events are talked about in each of your languages. And that is a really great way to contextually understand what's going on and how it's talked about, how you say that in your various languages. So that's number one, to read. A second one is to watch the TV news and listen to the radio news. Also, podcasts on YouTube on different uh, topics and whatnot can also be really helpful. And here we're talking about not just listening to them, but listening very closely, analyzing what it is that you're hearing. And this helps you keep abreast of what's happening in the world in different domains. And this can be relatively passive. What you're doing is just taking it in so that those events, those topics become part of your general awareness in long-term memory. So that down the road, if you have an interpretation or translation that relates to that, your mind will automatically access what you have already stored in long-term mem memory, remembering, oh yes, I've heard about this before. And uh, bring up that information. A third thing that you can do is to strengthen your general knowledge in domains like economics, history, the law, international politics, and scientific concepts. These are some of the large domains that come up again and again and again in actual assignments translating and interpreting. Because who are we interpreting and translating for? Politicians, world leaders, scientists at conferences, economists, business leaders, doctors, lawyers. These typically are the kind of people that we are interpreting for. And so we need to know, on a layperson level, we need to know what they know. One of the ways to do this is to take college level courses in these topics. You can also review textbooks, 
Wikipedia articles online. And you can also strengthen your knowledge in certain specialized fields. Once you become a translator or interpreter, one way to really distinguish yourself is to have a real area of expertise. I'll give you an example. One of uh, our current students um, actually had a previous career and uh, training as a doctoral student in biology. And so she has this very, very deep knowledge of biology and science writing in general. And so uh, over the summer, she went and did an internship at the National Institute for Agricultural Research and Agronomic Research in France. And they just loved her because she wasn't just translating the words. She really knew the material. And so she could approach it at a whole different level because she had that deep understanding. So the bottom line is anything and everything that you're exposed to, everything that you studied, will at some point during your translator a career as a translator or interpreter become relevant. So pay attention and say as you're listening in class, don't do it just passively, but as if you were going to need to explain that information to somebody else. Another real key way to prepare, in fact, an essential way, is to be sure that you live in a country where your foreign language or languages are spoken. In fact, at least here at the Monterey Institute, that is one of the requirements for admission, having lived for at least six months in a country where each of your working languages is spoken, so that if your languages are English, French, and Spanish, and you're a native English speaker, that would mean at least six months in France and at least six months in a Spanish-speaking country. In my experience, however, six months isn't nearly enough. At least a year, and probably a lot more than that. So if you're young enough that you have the opportunity to do a year abroad as a high school student or as a college student, absolutely seize that opportunity. And if you haven't lived abroad yet, in a country where your language is spoken, start making plans because you need to do that first. You can't approach translation and interpretation just on an academic level. You need to have lived the language and in a sustained kind of way because that's what's going to give you a much more immediate and intuitive understanding of what people are trying to express. You can't just kind of decode it and figure it out from the words on the page or the words that you hear um, in a recording. You need to have that immediate understanding and that comes only from experience and really living the language and interacting with others. Another thing that you'll want to do is to really refine your writing and your research skills. So uh, Given our digital age, people tend to be writing less and less, and you need to make a concerted effort to do exactly the opposite. On purpose, take courses that require a term paper. Term paper. On purpose, take advanced composition classes that will give you experience writing in different styles and in different ways, and really honing your grammar and your style in your native language. This is absolutely essential. And do it also in your foreign languages. You need those very deep writing skills that are superior to what most even college educated people uh, normally operate at. <clears throat> you can also practice this by practicing proofreading and editing yourself and others. At, on the oral side, you'll want to practice your public speaking skills, purposely putting yourself in situations where you talk in front of live audiences. This might be a speech course at university, or if there's like a Toastmasters club where people give public speeches in front of each other, absolutely do that. And otherwise, 
find any creative way you can, accept every opportunity to speak publicly in front of others. It's my experience with interpreting students that a lot of times what hangs them up is not so much the language. They have great language skills, but they're just so scared to get up in front of others and speak. And so by the time you enter a translation and interpretation program, you don't want that to be something novel for you. You already want to have a lot of experience doing that, so you're already comfortable in that role. Interpreting really is a public performance skill, and so you want to be used to being in front of the public. You'll also want to hone your analytical skills by practicing listening to speeches, by really reading written text at a different level. And in just a moment, I'll give you some real specifics on how you can do that. Another area is be becoming computer savvy if you're not already. You probably are, but there's some real specific things. The main thing is being coming very organized, first of all, in how you save all of your documents in folders and subfolders so that you can keep all of your documents uh, organized and straight so that it's easy to find them. Also, um, be sure that you become very adept at Microsoft Word, whether that's on the Mac platform or a PC program, a PC platform, excuse me. So you want to be able to use not just the basic functions, but make sure that you know how to format things, use tables, use text boxes, use review tools, uh, comparing documents, making electronic comments, uh, turning on uh, the revise, uh, track changes mode, and so on doing searches, all of these different kinds of functions will become, will be very useful to you as a translator. And of course, the other big area is becoming a master at Google searches um, and being adept at finding, being able to immediately find exactly the information that you need. Uh, try, and if you Google uh, uh, search tips, um, you can get nice lists of different things that you can do by putting in a country domain, by putting uh, quotation marks around a whole phrase to search on that phrase, by combining two different languages to find equivalents, and so on. So that's the basics for computer uh, skills. Another one that might seem a little funny is also to learn to take care of yourself. And by that I mean if you are in the habit of staying up really late or eating junk food or that kind of thing, now is the time to begin to change those habits. Be sure that you eat right, that you exercise regularly, that you get sufficient sleep and you find ways to reduce your own stress. And generally you're taking good care of yourself so that you can function optimally. As a translator and interpreter, you're going to need to be able to do that because to, say, interpret effectively, you need to be well rested and be function, functional, functioning optimally. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to maintain the kind of concentration that interpreting requires. And translation itself can require a lot of intensive work at the computer and you need to know how not to burn out. And the last thing that I would mention for uh, general preparation is be prepared for lifelong learning. I'm still learning every day about different topics and uh, new vocabulary in French and in English. Uh, just this week I was interpreting for uh, some French, exec ex French executives from France who work in the tomato industry. And I was amazed at all of the special terminology they have for different kinds of uh, tomatoes, green ripe tomatoes, and uh, plum tomatoes, and uh, cherry tomatoes, and this and that, and all of the different kinds of viruses that Those are things I'd never considered before. And so just this week, I needed to learn a whole new segment of my own language, English, all about tomatoes, and also in French. And so be prepared for that continuous learning. In fact, 
that continuous learning is something that draws a lot of people, including myself, to this profession. It is a continuing education your whole life long. Okay, so those are for the specifics. And now what I would like to do is talk with you about some specific things that you can do. And for this, I'm going to switch over to my PowerPoint uh, presentation so that you can see what I'm seeing on my screen. Okay, so I will just go to my next slide. First of all, what you have here is a URL, a web address, um, that's on the website of the Monterey Institute where you can find all of those 10 points that I just laid out for you in a written document. Um, so you can just go to the Monterey Institute web general website, www.mis.edu, and do a search for 10 ways to prepare for TNI. You'll find it that way, or you can cut and paste this URL if you look at this webinar again later. So, for uh, specific preparation for TNI, I'd like to first give you an analogy. So, let's say that you go to a art museum and you're walking in front of all the paintings. You think, "Oh, I like that one. Ah, I don't like that one so much." You might linger in front of one, thinking, "Wow, I just really like the feel of this painting." But then leave it at that and move on. Now you're gonna you would have a whole different kind of relationship, say, to this painting by Monet, if you knew that your task was going to be to reproduce this painting. Then you would look at it with a whole new eye, right? You'd look closely. You'd look at the arch of that bridge. You'd look at the colors. You'd look at where there is light and dark what's in the foreground, what's in the background. You would notice those reflections in the water. In short, you would really take in more, what's the overall feel of this? What is it that I, what effect do I want to be able to reproduce? And then you would look more closely at the structure of how it's composed. And then my guess is you would walk right up to the painting. Now this isn't very pretty because it's pixelated, right? Instead of uh, brush strokes. But you would walk up right up close to see exactly what those brush strokes were and what colors and blends of colors are used to then, when you step back, see this effect. And so we need to do the same thing with written texts. We need to learn to step in and take a much closer look. So let's first of all talk about oral texts or in other words recordings, oral speech and ways that you can analyze them in a similar way that you would analyze a painting with a view to reproducing it. So the first thing that you can do is to watch or listen to a segment of recording. So this might be something from the news online, or it might be a, a, a YouTube recording on a particular topic. From English, one great source is TED Talks, that's T-E-D. If you just Google TED Talks, you'll get to a whole library of really fascinating short length speeches on all sorts of different topics. After you watch or listen to that segment, maybe not the whole thing, but just a bit of it, then stop and orally summarize the key information that's been reported and summarize it for yourself. So I don't mean trying to remember every single little word, but... Um, ah, okay, hopefully you're seeing now what I see. Hang on just a second. I have to just slide through these. Okay, the let's. I'm trying to get you to see what I'm seeing on my screen. Which hmm. screen? Are, which one are you on? I'm looking at. So. You should be able to see that now. 
just okay. explain this. Hopefully you're seeing the screen that I am, which is titled Working with Recordings Analysis. So what I'm suggesting is that you watch or listen to a short segment of some audio or video recording. Stop the recording and then see if out loud you can explain to yourself in your own words what the person the points the person just made. And so the essential thing here is not to try to repeat the words. It's not a memory exercise in that way, but rather um, see if you understood the information by being able to explain it to yourself. Then, before you go forward, go back and replay that segment to see if you were actually able, if you understood and if you got all the key points. If not, well, try it again. Try to explain to yourself again all of the points that the person made. And keep doing that until you're actually able to get it. And then you can go on to the next segment. So that is one exercise that will help you to listen at a much deeper level. We usually listen so passively, you know, just kind of letting it flow over us like a stream or picking out just a few little bits of information that we might need. When we're interpreting, we need to listen deeply at a deep understanding level and this exercise will help. I've gone on to the next slide working with recordings analysis again but this time uh, presenting a number of variations. So first of all you can summarize in the way I just described in the same language as the recording and once you have that down try doing the same thing but instead of summarizing in the same language as the recording try summarizing that same information in one of your other languages, one of your foreign languages, for ex example, and vice versa. So if, for me, I'm a native English speaker, and so I might listen to something in French and try to summarize it in English, or listen in French, summarize in French, or listen in English and summarize in French, any which way around. And then another thing you can try is to listen but then instead of summarizing orally see if you can outline the key points on paper that will also be really helpful and good preparation particularly for consecutive interpretation where you let somebody speak for two three four five minutes while you take some notes and then you give the same speech in the target language Another way to work with recordings, much more for language enhancement, is to shadow the recordings in your foreign languages. Here's what I mean. So if somebody's in, is, say if English is your foreign language, you could use this very webinar to, after I say something, then you repeat exactly the same thing that I just said, trying to say it exactly as I say it with my accent, with my intonation, and all of that. So basically, you sound just like me. And that is something that you can do in each of your foreign languages. First of all, for comprehension. If you are trying to repeat out loud everything that someone says, that causes your, you to have to tune your ear to decipher exactly what they're saying. Because you can't repeat what you haven't actually deciphered and understood. Um, and so this can help your f comprehension in the foreign language. If you don't understand right away, just keep repeating the segment until you do understand. Or if after several tries you still can't understand, then ask a native speaker to listen to it and tell you in slow motion what the person is saying. Then secondly, doing this kind of shadowing, in order to adopt a native sounding expression and to um, experience in your own mouth, in your own voice, in your own mind, what it feels like to talk like a doctor, to talk like a scientist, to talk like a politician. And so this is where it's really great to go online, say to YouTube uh, videos of uh, the Chinese president or um, the uh, head of the UN or a doctor and just shadow, shadow what they're saying so that you feel in your own body and in your own voice what it feels like to express yourself as that person would express him or herself. Another thing that you can do as you're shadowing is if you come across 
uh, expressions or words that are unfamiliar to you, write them down and guess at what they might mean from context and also write down your guess. Then later you can go and look up those words to check and make sure what they really mean and also to see how good your guess is. And my guess is that you might be pleasantly surprised at how much you are able to intuit from context. And that is a key skill of translators and interpreters as well. Another thing which may seem banal but is a really great source of practice is to practice really listening in everyday life. By this I mean practice listening to people this, with the same depth and attentiveness as you have when working from a recording when you're going to try to summarize it. By that I mean listen attentively enough that you could actually explain what that person said to someone else. Another great way to do this is to try to reflect back to the person who has spoken what you just understood. So let's say, for example, that a friend of yours tells you that they went out last night and they had a really terrible time for all of these different reasons, and they tell you the story of what happened. A great thing that you can do is to reflect that back. Oh, so you're saying that this is what happened? And repeating back, not verbatim, but in your own words, the essence of what you understood that person to have just told you. For one thing, this will help you listen at a whole different level and practice your retention and summarizing and analysis techniques. And one great side benefit of that is that your friends and family might be pleasantly surprised because rarely do we listen to each other with that kind of attention. And I bet they'll really appreciate it. Now let's talk about working with written text. So you can read a news article or other document but then instead of just reading it passively, read it actively and work with it just as we talked about with uh, oral texts. So explain it to yourself out loud in your own words. Or you can write a summary of it. Or outline the key points. Or diagram it. And you might want to do that either with it in front of you or try doing it from memory. All of those are really great exercises. Also in working with texts, you can do things as you read. For example, as don't just passively read, but with each sentence ask yourself, okay, what is this sentence actually doing? Is the author stating a thesis, setting the stage for something, providing an example, presenting an opposing point? And by asking yourself this question, what is this sentence doing? in relation to the previous sentence and the next sentence that comes, you can begin to really appreciate the structure of a written text and the thought process that the author went through. Just as you might look with a different eye at that Monet painting and appreciate its composition. Another way to do this is to print out the article or the other text and outline it in shorthand in the margin, just so like key words in the margin. That's another active way to explain to yourself the key points being made. Another good exercise is to read through the text and circle all of the linking words between ideas. By that I mean the words like and or but, however, nevertheless, in conclusion, for example, all of these kinds of links that tell you what the connection between ideas are. That is what it helps you follow somebody's logic. And both in translation and especially in interpretation, those links become critical to being able to logically analyze and digest what someone is saying. And also, they're really handy to have. You want to have a nice pocket full of those kinds of words to help you as you interpret. Another thing you might do is go through a text and highlight all of the words that convey an opinion or suggest a point of view or that tinge the text with a certain tone. Doing this will help you appreciate how the text leaves you with the feeling that it does or convinces you 
of an argument or lets you know what the author thinks and feels about the topic being discussed. And this will help you when you go to translate or interpret. Really pay attention to the nuance and choose your words in such a way that they too evoke that same sense that the painter, the author, wants to convey. Also, for language enhancement with work, when working with written texts, and I've gone on to the next slide here, one simple but very effective thing to do is simply to read texts, particularly in your foreign languages, out loud. This helps you gain fluency, and also it helps you internalize really effective um, turns of phrase and sentence structures and make them your own by the sheer fact that you're not just passively looking at them, but you're speaking them. They're coming out of your own mouth using your own voice. And in that way, by speaking those words as someone else has so effectively articulated an idea, you will then increasingly be able to do likewise. And those constructs, those devices in your foreign language will be increasingly available to you when it comes to translate or interpret. A similar way to do this is to from a written text to transcribe a couple of paragraphs. Let's say you're reading an opinion piece in the New York Times and you feel that the author in one paragraph has been particularly adept at really effectively conveying an opinion or an idea and you feel like wow I'd really like to be able to express myself that way well one thing you can do is longhand and I mean with pen or pencil in hand on paper not typing but really with your own hand copying word for word that paragraph the reason why I'm saying with your own hand is by it kinesthetically going through your own body and slowing things down with the time that it takes to write and by sub-vocalizing like in your own mind saying the words aloud to yourself as you write that's a way to internalize those structures using multiple sensory pathways also with written texts just as with oral when you come across unfamiliar vocabulary, first guess at the meaning and then look it up. So lastly, I would suggest that you keep a notebook. So this can either be a small pocket notebook um, that you can carry with you everywhere, or if you're much more comfortable texting and that sort of thing, you may want to keep some lists in your smartphone. So one list that I would recommend you keep is one of words and expressions that you encounter and that you want to assimilate into your own vocabulary. Let's say that you're reading a text uh, uh, article in the newspaper and you come across a really great expression for something. And you think, oh, wow, that is wonderful. I want to be able to use that. Well, write it down in your notebook and then uh, each morning review your list and keep it short just each day try for just a few things just a few expressions or a few terms that you will purposely use during the day weaving that into your conversation or weaving that into your own writing and that's a way to assimilate those expressions in that vocabulary and really make them your own and once they're just there and accessible to you and you find that you're using them naturally, then go on to assimilating other ones. A second list is pay attention to things you think, but you realize, gosh, I just really don't know how to say that in English or French or Chinese or whatever your foreign language is. Write down in your native language what that thought is or what that object is or what that feeling is or what that joke might be. And then by writing it down, that helps your eyes and your ears be like a radar, staying attuned to picking them up in your environment. And when you then hear or see a perfect expression for that thought be used, capture it, 
write down how the person expressed that very same feeling, but in your foreign language. Write it down next to where you originally noted it in your notebook. And that way, you can acquire new equivalents for things you wish you knew how to say. And again, practice using those until it becomes just natural and is uh, your own. So here, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, hi there, so that we can see each other again. I hope that these basic exercises are really helpful to you. And they're just a starting place. I'm sure that as I was speaking, you probably had 10 other uh, variations on these exercises that you might like to try. But the main thing is, now let me back up and say, why not practice translating? Why not practice interpreting? I suppose you could, but that's what you go to translation and interpretation school for, right? That's what we teach you to do. The danger, if you try to jump into just right away translating things and practice that way, is that it's all too easy to mm, get stuck on the surface and just be translating the words rather than really thinking about the deeper meaning and attending to that. The exercises that I've suggested instead focus you on the analysis, focus you on reading at a whole different level, listening at a whole different level, really digesting what it is that you're hearing, what it is that you're reading, and expanding your vocabulary uh, to much broader. I'd like to come back to the painting analogy with a few props I have for you. So, you know that Monet painting that you uh, have to reproduce? Well, it's not just reproducing it, but let's say that you have to reproduce it. But So, Monet used these paintbrushes here, but you have to reproduce it using these paintbrushes here. Hmm. It might be hard to get the same effect. Similarly, let's say that Oops, I'm losing my paintbrushes here. Let's say that Monet used these paints here, but you don't have those available. All you've got is this set of paints here. That's exactly how it is with translating and interpreting. Something is expressed in one language, and then we have to express that same thing, but like using a different set of paintbrushes, a different set of paints. In other words, a different language which has different words for those things, which has different linguistic devices, which has different turns of phrase, which might have a different sentence structure and is embedded in a different culture. And so by doing the exercises that I've suggested, working between your languages and within each language for comprehension, that helps you get used to seeing how can I get, how can I work with a full set brushes and paints so that when it comes to having to reproduce something produced in this language, I have all sorts of options available to me. You know, in that way, you're working with this, right? If you don't do that kind of language enhancement, really expanding your vocabulary and actively making new expressions your own, well, you might just be working with this. And you know, if you're just working with this, you're never going to get the same effect, right? And so you want to have as much at your disposal as you can in each of your foreign languages so that, to use another analogy, you're playing with a full deck of cards, not just one suit, not just a few numbers, because then you're never going to win, right? You need the whole deck in order to be able to do this. So with that, I'm going to stop talking and maybe we can take some questions. And with, for that, I'm going to need a little assistance because I don't often work in Google Hangouts. So can we move to some questions? Sure. <laughs> uh, sure. Hi, everybody. This is Bob, <laughs> without whom this wouldn't happen. Uh, so we have a question. Um, I'm going to pull randomly from the questions here. Okay. So this is from Stephen Lee. He says, um, hi, I leave this post hoping you'll answer it. If at all possible, I'd like to exclusively be a translator. Game, website, app translations would be my preferred field. But frankly, are all language specialists expected to translate and interpret? 
Mm. Thank you for that question. Who is that from? That's from Stephen Lee. Stephen, thank you so much for that question. No, you do not have to both translate and interpret. So I'm really glad you raised this question because there are a few of us, like me, who like to both translate and interpret. It really is a matter of what you're good at, what you enjoy, and what kind of lifestyle you want. Now, if you're really into gaming and websites and that kind of thing, it absolutely makes sense for you not to worry so much about interpreting and to really focus on uh, gaming and website uh, localization. And in fact, that's a whole specialty that we offer here at the Monterey Institute uh, called Translation Localization Management, where you do get some of the uh, introductory translation courses so that you really appreciate the kind of language manipulation that I've been talking about and how to idiomatically express something in the target language. But then you also have lots of technology classes on localization and gaming and all of those kinds of things so that you learn the technology that you need behind that to effectively do it. And another big advantage is that we happen to be right next door to the Silicon Valley here. And so there are partnerships with all of the startups and whatnot that do just that kind of work. And so you can get some hands-on um, experience. So you may want to be a localizer. You may want to be just a translator. You really like the written word. You really like to be able to research things and really refine how things are expressed in writing. Or you might love uh, just the adrenaline that you get being on the hot site seat out there interacting with people um, and interpreting. So it very much depends on your own uh, disposition. Here, when you start, we try to kind of give you everything so you get a taste of what these different things are like because you might be surprised, never thought of yourself as an interpreter, but find that you're really good at it and you love it. Or vice versa, you might have always dreamed of being an interpreter, but then when you really try it, you realize, oh my gosh, this is not for me. I just want to be able to commune with my computer and do this in the peace of my own office. Um, so that I hope that answers your question, Stephen. All right, we have another question. Um, yes. Again, I'm just pulling randomly from the from the uh, questions here and the, uh, the comments. This is from, uh, and excuse my pronunciation, uh, Vaishnavi Gupta uh, from India. Um, Vaishnavi is a, is a language student uh, specializing French literature with a Japanese with undergraduate studies in Japanese Wow! Uh, and wants to pursue masters in translation and interpretation um, and the question is about preparation mm -hmm. um, uh, they say that they've been reading books journals and listening to the news but applications of translation skills is different than reading in books also having literature background makes it difficult to get the knack of commercial and medical translation mm -hmm. what would you suggest Mm. Well, I hope that everything that I presented in this webinar is really uh, relevant to answering your question here. It's about busting outside the world of literature and making a point of reading all sorts of different kinds of written material, particularly uh, current events in different kinds of news magazines and newspapers and all of that and trying the different kinds of um, exercises that I've suggested. That will give you an excellent foundation. Um, so doing that in your Japanese, doing that in your French, and in you may have a number of different native languages being from uh, India. Um, so really practicing that in each of those different languages. And you were concerned, for example, with uh, becoming adept at medical terminology. Well, don't be shy. Go on to YouTube. And um, I'll use another example. In translation, we just translated a text on prosthetic heart valves. Well, look up something like that or look up something on cancer or another disease that's of concern to you personally uh, because you have a friend or, or a family member suffering from it. And read about that in each of your different languages. Look for podcasts on that topic. Shadow them, analyze them in all of the ways that we've discussed. And you'll be amazed at how quickly you can um, acquire those sub-languages of various areas of medicine or the law or whatever those areas are that you're wanting to learn more about. If you feel 
in your gut. It's like, oh, you know, gosh, I really don't know much about economics. Well, then take up that challenge and force yourself to read the finance pages of the newspaper or listen to TED Talks on different aspects of economics. And quickly, <clears throat> those topics will become familiar to you. And the more familiar they become, the more enjoyable they become. And you'll find that you just soak it up. Great. Here's another question. Um, this is from Agatha Maya. It, it relates to some of, some of what you've been talking about. Um, she asks, what would be one crucial daily habit of a professional interpreter that an interpretation student could easily adopt? Reading the newspaper in each of your languages every day, or you could syncopate listening to um, the radio, uh, say online, you know, via the web, in each of your languages, just even for 10 minutes every day, just to be soaking that up. That's what interpreters do. They stay abreast of things as events are unfolding in the world. They're hearing about it in their different languages. So, you know, what kinds of things are interpreted and translated? In this case, we're talking about interpreting. Well, what's going on in the world? What matters to the world? The big issues in the world, whether that's climate change or water or uh, events in the Middle East or events in Ukraine or the economic crisis, this is what's floating around in the world. So the more that you steep yourself in it, in your various languages, then when it comes to expressing other people's thoughts about that, the easier it is. It's all there somewhere. All right, I think we have time for maybe one more. Okay. Uh, this is from Rie Okoso. Um, I'll read, a, read this a little bit. Um, she says her name's Rie, and she's currently working as an in-house interpreter translator mm. for an automobile company. Mm. She would like to study uh, for an advanced degree in conference interpreting to re reinforce the foundations necessary for her profession and also to put herself in an environment where she can be with people from different backgrounds to be able to see how others interpret and handle situations. Here are a couple of questions. Yeah. For people like herself who are already working in the profession, what would you say would be the best way to further enhance her skills? And she's also asking kind of about timing in terms mm -hmm. of making the change, um, kind of leaving a, leaving a position, leaving a job to go for advanced study, trying to figure out when, when the timing would be right to, to make such a change. Mm. Those are big questions. So for the first one, in terms of preparing, um, I hope that the things that I've outlined in this webinar are directly answer that question and you may want to try those things. So it sounds like every day, all day, you're talking and thinking and speaking automotives, right? And so what's going to be key for you probably is to purposely in your personal time be taking in paying attention to other topics, right? So that you expand your view and your range in the ways that I've suggested. In terms of timing for advanced studies, that's a very personal question. It's going to depend, of course, on your finances. If you're hoping to come back to the same job, if you're thinking maybe you'd make a job change. And of course, doing your background uh, homework on thinking about where it is that you want to go to school, where, whether that's, say, in Japan, or if it's somewhere in Europe, if it's here at the Monterey Institute in the United States and compare the entrance requirements and also the cycle for when your application needs to be in and what's required at what time of the year so that you know what your options are now and if you want to go for one opportunity or another you know how far in advance you need to um, to use an American expression, get your ducks in a row, right? Get everything prepared and make sure that you're hitting those deadlines so that you don't have to bypass um, those opportunities. But I think that your thinking is wonderful of getting out of your current environment, really changing it up, getting out of your comfort zone, mixing it up with people of different cultures and really interacting. And that brings up how we teach interpreting. You're not just sitting there listening to lectures. Completely the opposite. Most of what we do in class is actual practice. Giving each other speeches, interpreting them, trying again, doing practice groups outside of class, interacting, doing mock meetings, uh, having mock trials, 
that are interpreted, all of this kind of thing to really practice the doing of it with people in all sorts of different languages. Just next week, we're going to put together the uh, German students, the Chinese students, and the French students um, to recount internship experiences they've had and have them interpret for each other. And so these are the kinds of things that we do day in and day out, and that will really prepare you for being able to interpret, even if you haven't been doing it on the job. There's a few more, but I think we're out of time. Okay. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Or if you're watching this later, I hope that this has been helpful. And with uh, my colleagues here at the Institute, I'll find out how I can read all of your other questions that came through. And perhaps we can uh, um, devise some mechanism for responding to those questions as well in some other phone, a form or some other form. So stay tuned for that. With that, have a good night or a good rest of your day. Thank you.